In Yemen, Oxfam has also launched its political inclusion of civil society initiative in collaboration with partners as well as the Civil Society Spokespeople Project, both focusing on opening up the space for dialogue within civil society to inform and to be informed about their country's political agendas. <laughs> Internationally, and actually in fact I was in Brussels three weeks ago, uh, doing some serious lobbying with the EU, uh, what we're calling on in the EU on the EU and the G8, for example, to ensure that the civil society is involved in the development of their donor policies across the region. And that an enabling environment for participation of civil society is, uh, is in place in terms of their policies in the transition process. And actually, in fact, Oxfam has just uh, published a paper called Power to the People, the EU's response to the Arab Spring. And I'm happy to share that with many people. Finally, and across the region, Oxfam has also launched the Regional Gender Program, which focuses on empowering women's voices. And in the wake of the Arab Spring, of course, the increasing uh, women voices out there and increasing of the women's political participation and their role in their country's agendas. These are only but a few initiatives that Oxfam has focused on in the wake of the Arab Spring. By focusing on strengthening local civil society actors to engage in their country's reform agendas and working to increase women's political participation, we hope to bring about the, the positive change that we seek with our partners in the region. But like I said, there's so much more that needs to be done. And Oxfam, like most big NGOs, is struggling to ensure its response is the most relevant in the most unpredictable of circumstances. On the 24th of November, 2011, Oxfam published a solidarity statement calling on the Egyptian <coughs> authorities to end the violence and exercise uh, restraint in terms of excessive use of lethal weapons and tear gas in specific with the protests in Tahrir Square. This brings me to the second perspective uh, as an activist. So I'm going to take my Oxfam hat off now and I'm going to put on my activist hat. <clears throat> we know, we all know what happened on the 25th of January uh, in Egypt. Simply, people took to the streets in demand of two basic political rights. They were not to call for regime change at that point. And on the 25th, on Tuesday actually, the 25th, people took to the streets to call for constitutional reform as well as the end to the emergency law, which had plagued Egypt for many decades. I was one of the first people on the streets, and I have to say that from my own personal perspective, what started out as a few hundred people in the street marching from about 200 meters away from Tahrir Square ended up in Tahrir Square, which was the epicenter of the revolution. About maybe, I would say, 1,500 people, and that was just in the span of 200 meters. There were people coming to Tahrir Square on that day from all over the city and across the city. And by the time people came to Tahrir Square, it was a massive movement. It was literally as spontaneous as that. What follows is history and was aired on most international global TV channels. In the few months after the fall of Mubarak, there was optimism in the air. People had found their voices. And what more, they had used their voices to bring about change and to bring it down the tyrant, of course, which was Mubarak. Egypt changed overnight, a country that had no people power, no networks in terms of previous social uh, movements or previous civil society movements of quality. There was lots of civil society organizations, but uh, very much aligned to the government and very much uh, limited. Became one of the, the countries that was harboring the largest organized people network in the region. Groups of youth. <coughs> were constantly organizing themselves. Campaigning was born. Um, it was the tool, and an effective tool, in fact, to bring about change. Reform on all levels, social, political, and economic, was the end game. And that's what people were really seeking after Mubarak. In the months that follows, enthusiasm and hopes were unfortunately dying out. Um, and slightly crushed, and we see that head-to-head -head in October and November events in Tahrir. This is because of the military council that took over the country and was the protectorate of the revolution. Uh, I would say 
was really restricted in its ability to move the country ahead in terms of reform and had no clarity in terms of a roadmap of where the country's going. And in fact, the intentions of the army in the nine months that followed after the revolution became quite clear that they were the obstacle to reform. They were a product of the regime, of the old regime. Change was not their game, and they were of a military mindset and not political reformers. And on the 18th of November, people took to the streets once more. Frustration led to that. People wanted some change, and it was extremely desperate time after the revolution. So people who say the Egyptian revolution happened, Mubarak fell. Am I getting a card? Sorry. OK, I'll try to wrap up. Just a flash. Uh, <laughs> Mubarak fell, and everything was fine in Egypt. That is far from true. And, and I think that's one of the messages that I keep on talking about coming back from Egypt. On the 18th of November, people took to the streets again. The same pattern emerged. And this is the exact same pattern that you'll see throughout and across the region of the Arab Spring. Spontaneous organization of people to demand political change. Authorities retaliate, unfortunately, with excessive force and brutality. The numbers swell. That's the only byproduct of the government actually retaliating in force, is that the numbers swell. Networks emerge. Young leaders emerge. The demands are reorganized, the stakes rise. So if you notice in November and also in January, people took to the streets with political demands. Because of the, this pattern that I've just explained, the demands became, we're asking for the Supreme Council to step down. We're asking for Mubarak to step down, and so on and so forth. So there is a pattern emerging, which I think was probably the same in Libya and Syria. In fact, I know it was probably the same in Libya and Syria and also <coughs> Yemen. I can tell the story of Tahrir over and over again, and I'm happy to talk to people about it and share my experiences. <clears throat> in fact, the same story could possibly be told in and across the region. I'm not going to cover the, the elections at this point that have just happened last week in Egypt, and all I have to say about that is the rise of the Islamist movement in the Arab world, whether that be Tunisia, recently Morocco, or Egypt, could be seen by a lot of people as a threat to civil society work, as a threat to a secular uprising or a network. However, I do not share that. I think that if we're going to ask for democracy in the Middle East, and if they have had the majority in the parliament in the case of Egypt, then let's support that. Let's see what happens. After all, we are calling for democracy. So after four years, perhaps we can change. And I hope we can change. Anyhow, how does this all relate to yesterday's discussion and today's discussion is really summed up in two points. I think what the Arab world has proven to the world in the past 12 months is that the world order as we know it is unsustainable. Change is inevitable. Groups, coalitions, civil society organizations, organized social movements, call them what you wish, <laughs> is at and will always be at the center of change. And I think that here for us in this platform, it really is an opportunity that cannot be missed. We need to really think about these young groups emerging and how we can work and interface with them. <coughs> the past 12 months has shown us, and this is my final point, um, has shown us that all the elements that we all work so hard to get as part of civil society work and civil society organizations have already emerged organically. Whether it be the Arab Spring or the Occupy movement, the voiceless have now had gained a voice. The unrepresented have also have a real chance to be represented. The organization of people with a common goal for reform or change is achievable. The efficient use of technology to gain knowledge that furthers the cause, like social media, information technology, and others, has become widespread and is a reality. So we have representation, we have organization, we have a common goal that we're working through. We've got technology as a tool for knowledge. The challenge for us, I believe, as civil society organizations, is how to capitalize on these elements and turn them into a force of lasting and sustainable change that would lead to a better world and may lead us, as civil society organizations, to finally achieve our goal, which is inducing and creating change, not just as we do in many instances, responding to it. Thank you.